Optophobia, the fear of opening one's eyes. This podcast is dedicated to encouraging you, our listeners, to move beyond that fear, to solve riddles they don't want us to unriddle, to investigate supposedly ironclad truths, to unearth evidence buried for so long they believed it would stay buried. Season 2, Deep State. The Deep State is real. And it's just that, a 51st state, hidden from the American people and unacknowledged by the federal government, even as it pulls the government's most important levers. How do you hide an entire state? You bury it. Deep. In Civics 101, we're taught the particulars of the visible constitutional state. The one you can visit in Washington. The one you vote for. Deep state is just a new term for a phenomenon that's influenced American democracy for 150 years. To many, it describes another more shadowy, more indefinable government. That description is accurate, but it's not the whole story. In July 1861, weeks after the first major fight of the Civil War, the first battle of Bull Run, members of President Lincoln's inner circle nervous about his chances at reuniting the nation, decided the country needed a backup plan in case the capital fell. They sent a small group of civil engineers called the Shovelmen to scout locations in the West. Today, some say the hole dug by the Shovelmen, believed to be underneath the Colorado-Wyoming border, houses a powerful bureaucracy rumored to be 600,000 strong. So why is a shadow government designed to silently run the real version of American democracy suddenly a regular topic of conversation within the constitutional state? Is there dissent in today's deep state? What's the ultimate goal of deep state leadership? This season on Optophobia, we'll track down the distortions, the assumptions, the omissions. Are you bored by the lies? Open your eyes. I'm your host, Russell Dalrymple. I had wondered when we first decided to tackle the idea of the deep state for the second season of Optophobia, whether we'd be able to secure guests who had actually lived there. We are now in the second half of this season, and so far we've interviewed a couple of traditional 50 residents who have been secretly taken down to the deep state, but we have yet to talk to anyone who lived there as an adult. So it's really exciting to welcome our guest this week. We will get to Henry in a few minutes, but first, I wanted to catch you guys up on this really interesting thread we've been pulling about the deep state's origins. Over the last couple of weeks, we've discussed an email exchange I've been having with an optophobia listener named Todd Snosh. Mr. Snosh is writing a book about Dippy, a Diplodocus dinosaur fossil, that paleontologists working for Andrew Carnegie discovered in Medicine Bow, Wyoming in 1899. Dippy was one of the most complete dinosaur fossils ever found at the time and immediately became a global sensation. So much so that in 1902, when King Edward VII visited Carnegie at Carnegie's Skibo Castle in the northern highlands of Scotland, he saw a sketch of Dippy and asked Carnegie to find him his own dinosaur, for the British Museum. Instead, Carnegie hired a crew of Italian plasterers to construct a life-size replica of Dippy. When Germany's Kaiser Wilhelm II heard that Great Britain was getting a dinosaur, he asked Carnegie for one, too. And soon, France, Austria, Italy, Russia, Argentina, Spain, and Mexico all requested Dippy copies. What King Edward... And the other leaders didn't know, according to Snosh's research, was that Carnegie was working for the U.S. Army's Military Information Division, and that each copy of Dippy was actually a state-of-the-art listening post to gather foreign intelligence for President Theodore Roosevelt's administration. So, as Snosh is finding all of this information, he stumbles on a document that seems like the original orders 
to send the shovelmen west at the beginning of the Civil War. That document includes a note from Lincoln's spiritual advisor, Bishop Matthew Simpson, to a Habakkuk with specific instructions about where to dig. It's likely that Habakkuk is Captain Habakkuk P. Mott, a former member of the 1st New York Engineers Company of the Union Army, who was recruited to the Shovelman, according to Xavier Diaz in his essay, Send the Shovelman. We actually have a photo of Captain Mott on our Instagram at, at Optophobes, if you want to check it out. As you guys know by now, Todd Snosh is not the most efficient at passing on his research to us, so this week, again, he emailed us just a small snippet of new information rather than doing a document dump, which is what I've asked for. But we'll take what we can get from uh, such a rich source of Shovelman original info. And this is what we got this week. Snosh has found a reply written by Habakkuk in which the young engineer tells Bishop Simpson that, quote, we set up camp in a place called Walbright. It is at the southern foot of the great Medicine Bow Range, where the native people come to make their weapons from the mahogany trees. We will conduct soil tests to see if digging should begin. End quote. So a little more information from Todd. If you're listening and you can help pull at this thread, please get in touch with us via the Optophobia website. So let's get on with this show. I am here with my regular co-host, musical consultant, and loving grandmother, Muriel Walland. Hi, Russell. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Oh, I'm good. Busy, busy, busy. Just as always, with three grandbabies to keep up with. Running around. Oh, my God. We had the bake sale for the she Hole Band, the she Hole High School Band, that um, Behemoth and Mephistopheles and Paxton are all part of. Oh, they're all in the band. They're all in the band. They all play the organ. They all, they play, all play different organs, actually. Huh. Mephistopheles plays the stomach. And Behemoth plays the esophagus, and Paxton just plays the large uh, colon. When you say that they play the esophagus and the stomach and the colon, what? How does that? I've never heard of those as instruments. Well, before. just in the shell band, they're a little, they're a little different. They they have some some fun kind of uh, cheeky silly instruments so they've got their organs and they've got the tambourine which is just a woman named Tamara um, who they've eviscerated and then they just play her so they just slap they just slap her belly and she makes a little noise oh they're all just dehydrated organs huh it doesn't sound like it's a beautiful sound is it as I always like to say beauty's in the eye of the beholder mm-hmm and I guess I didn't realize that Paxton was in the, into the same things that Mephistopheles. Paxton, of course. Why wouldn't he be? They're all brothers. They're all my grandbabies. He just has such a different name. Well, I think that that is. Um, I think that's a little discriminatory. Mm-hmm. If I were to say Russell Dalrymple, that's a different name. I bet he's into Dally Rimpling. What what would you say to that? Would you feel discriminated against? Maybe I would feel like it's a little too on the nose, which could be another instrument that's played in the Sheol band. There is an there is an on the nose nose instrument. They just blow it. They blow the nose. They blow it. Well, if you would like more background, oh oh no, I was just gonna say I have a a new kind of wrinkle that that I want to get to at some point regarding my theory. So. All I can say is, where's Kobe? That's a, that's the new rink. Oh, I see what you're saying. Where's Kobe? I think that he might be with all the other celebrities that are supposedly dead. I'm doing my air quotes again. They're dead. So this is they're not. They're on just in the deep stage. Jimi Hendrix, Biggie, Tupac, Tupac, but also James Dean, Brittany Murphy, Brittany Murphy, the. Fast and Furious guy. Paul Walker. So you are wondering or you have information that Kobe is I just have information that he is not on the he's not on the rolls of the upstairs or the downstairs, if you know what I mean. Yeah. I'm not gonna get into how I know, but I have connections and I just know. You know, a grandmother just knows sometimes. Before we talk to our actual guest, I want to tell everybody, because we had promoted our guest last week who was not able to join us, Karen Chats-Worthington. She's a public sector economist 
who was going to walk us through her theory of how the deep state is funded. How does all that work without taxes? And I know from her blog, deepstatebling.livejournal.com, that it has something to do with geothermal energy storage. But we're going to have to wait to talk to her because Karen has been trapped in her car since last Thursday. So we'll have to talk to her when she gets out of the car. We were, however, extremely fortunate because Henry Kelly, an accountant from Portland, was able to join us at the last minute. Henry, thank you so much for being here and welcome to Optophobia. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Would you take a couple seconds and just kind of tell us a little bit about where you're from and uh, what you do? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I'm um, Henry Kelly, of course. Um, most people call me Kelly Count em Up or The Numberman. Um, I, I served as an uh, accountant down in the deep state. Down in the state underneath, you understand? Yeah. Uh, I, 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 I wasn't born there. I was born in Portland, and, and that's where I live now. I'm born in Portland. Uh, but I, I, I had an affinity for numbers ever since a, a young age. You know, people knew I, I had the numbers in me. And I was born in 1939. So I actually, when I was two, I went to work on the Manhattan Project. When you were two? I was two years old. They took me to. They took. They took me over there. I said, "Hey, hey, kiddo, you're good at numbers." And it didn't have a lot of, you know. They were. It was. A, it was a sexist uh, 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 society back then. So they. They still were looking for men, and uh, you know, I, I. I am a man. So I went down there and I. I did some math for them, and then uh, of course that I got noticed, as I started growing up, by the deep state, and uh, eventually I just went to sleep one day. Woke up underground. Oh, that's interesting. So you were, so you are actually a Portland native. Technically, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm born in Portland. My home, my home is in, is in the, is in the the deep state. Yeah. My home is, is, uh, is District Mary Todd. Mary Todd? Yeah, District Mary Todd. All the, in the, in the deep state, uh, all of the districts are named for different aspects of Abraham Lincoln's life. Oh. Mm Mm-hmm. Because we all know the, the deep state's origin story and, uh, we uh, so so all the districts, you know, there's district uh, top hat, district beard, district, uh, district mold, log, district log. You know what district log? I'm just guessing. Yeah, no, there's of course the district log, uh, district boot to the back of the head, district. That one's on the nose. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know why that there's a there are more districts than you would think that are named for aspects of his death. Mm. More than you would think. So let's go backwards a little bit and talk about your about growing up. It's interesting that sure, you sure. Uh, had these mathematical abilities so early that the that they used you when you were two for maybe the most advanced scientific experiment ever at that time to build the atomic bomb mm-hmm. at the time. Yeah. 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 How did they know about you? How did they know that you were uh, this kind of numbers whiz kid? So my, my mother, Mariah Kelly, she showed me off, you know, she, cause I, I, I was counting real early. I couldn't speak, but I could do numbers. You know, she would say how much change is in my pocket right now. And she would pull out a lot of change and they didn't have corn star back then. So I would, I would just count, I would quickly look at it and say, I mean, you have you have you two dollars. So she, she showed me off at all these. I was in the traveling fair circuit. Counting money? Counting money, counting the county. Original coin star. Original. (laughs) That's clever. That's clever. That's clever. They did not call me that. Mm. So I went town to town and then eventually, sometimes you're going to towns with operatives in them. Sometimes you go into towns like Washington, D.C. And so I believe I caught the eye of somebody. Of course, I'm, you know, I was a child. I didn't, I, I could not speak. All I could do was numbers. So I, of course, was asked about a job. And my mother, of course, you know, she said, yes, of course, you can, you can take my baby because they need money at the time. You know, they're not doing well. They're not getting a lot of money from the GI. You know, we're spending a lot of money on the war at that time. A lot of money on the war. So the Manhattan Project took you presumably to New Mexico, and gave your mother money, and that's where you worked yes. on the Manhattan That's where I worked from, from age two to age five. Afterwards, I went to Germany to help with their reconstruction efforts. <laughs> they were devastated. You been to Berlin? 
I've seen pictures of what it was like. In right 1945 Berlin? Yeah. Bad place. Ugly. And you were doing the accounting or just sort of figuring out all the money? And just, so I was a little older then. I could speak a little bit then. And I, so I was doing numbers. I, I can look at it. They needed to rebuild physically as well as uh, uh, spiritually, mentally, and econ- econ- economically. And I went down there and I, I said, I told them what angles they needed to build things at. Cause they had lost, they had had a brain drain, and you know they, had, or they had a brain gain, and then they had a brain drain. So I went there to sort of uh, replace some of this brain power, and they needed to build. And I'm, I'm, I'm an amateur architect at this point. I mean, but I can see, I can see something, and I can tell what angle it needs to be built at. So they were asking me, they were saying, oh, uh, oh we need, we need to build, we need to have a capital again. And I say, okay, forty-five degrees. Okay, ninety-one degrees. You were building buildings at 45 degree angles? Yeah, some buildings. Wow. Uh huh. Yeah, because sometimes you need to. It's because revolutionary. They were, because, well, they weren't allowed to have any, any sharp, they weren't allowed to have any, like, harsh, uh, uh, more, you know, brutalist sort of angles. Mm. Uh, because of because they they were you know demasculating and whatnot after the war and uh, that was part of their that was part of their agreement ah. that was part of their agreement they said no no verticals no verticals no more that's too tall because Mr Kelly in Sheol I'm an underground city architect and in in Sheol we use exclusively harsh angles we want them to look harsh and pointy and stabby angles. As you know, I am from I'm from District Mary Todd. Go go MTs. So I love a harsh angle. Oh, is that the mascot of Mary Todd? Is the the Mary Todds? So we have an annual festival where we all, because of course every district has their own annual festival, but they all coincide around the same time um, uh, in succession, so you can all go and visit each other's districts. But we all dress up like Mary Todd. And so we and we all have we have big you know foam heads and foam fingers. She had large hands. Those are those are real size. Those are foam. They made of foam. For her, those are the real thing. Like for yeah, everybody for else, Mary it's Tom, back in the day. Yeah, you ain't you ain't heard the story of Mary Todd's hands. No, man, huge hands, huge hands, large mm-hmm. finger 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 nails were sturdy, like a horse. Horses are known for having sturdy fingernails. Sturdy fingernails. They got one big one. Yeah, one large fingernail, just like Mary Todd. Let's take a quick break, and we will be right back with Henry Kelly. Hey, optophobes. One of the most frightening things any of us experience doesn't have sharp teeth. It doesn't have a gun. It's not a trap door you fall through, and then it's totally pitch black and completely silent, and after several seconds of nothingness... An old, knotted, slimy hand grabs the back of your neck. It's not that. No, one of the most frightening things any of us experience is uncertainty. You know that feeling you get when somebody in China ate a bat for some reason, and before you know it, you're on Google Hangouts with your boss every 20 minutes in front of a giant pile of laundry, and if some guy put a gun to your head and said, find me an onion, you'd know you were a goner because he might as well have said, make my eyes into tarantulas. The terrifying thing about a pandemic is the uncertainty. When will it end? Will my loved ones and friends be okay? Will my 401k even be a thing afterwards? At Blend Venom Solutions, we've found a way to avoid uncertainty in challenging times. It's called certainty. More accurately, it's called Mozambique Tambati Clarity Paste, and if you apply it pretty constantly, you can avoid your fear of the unknown. And by apply, I mean slather. Just slather Mozambique Tambati Clarity Paste from your shoulders to about mid-thigh every couple of hours from now until mid-June, and you won't have any worries about what may or may not be around the corner. Mozambique Tambati Clarity Paste is made from the venom of the Mozambique Spitting Cobra combined with the fruit of the Tamboti tree. The Mozambique Spitting Cobra's venom is both neurotoxic and cytotoxic. Mixed with the Tamboti fruit, the venom produces an embrocation that, when applied or slathered constantly for the entirety of a mass social distancing emergency, will give you clarity and assurance that all will be well. This is because the cytotoxins in the venom of the Mozambique spitting cobra trigger electrical flares in the brain that resemble the clarity some people get in the seconds before they die. But you won't die, we don't think. 
Order a tub of Mozambique Tombati Clarity Paste today and see how much you really care about knowing what happens tomorrow. Blend Venom Solutions. We take away your fears using snakes. We are back with Henry Kelly. Count them up, Kelly. Could Count them up, Kelly. I feel like we're comfortable now, so you, y'all, y'all can call me Count them up, Kelly. Did they call you that in high school at uh, Mary Todd High? Yes, they did. They called me Count, they called me Count them up, Kelly, then, um, because, uh, again, I had a lot of skills that these other children did not possess. They don't teach everybody math. They, they're very specialized down there. You know, if you, if you show affinity for a thing, if you're good at something, that's your track forever. Because we can't be messing around with doing, you know, whatever you want and being bad at stuff. I went to a restaurant here on the surface state. I went to a restaurant, and the waiter didn't come back with my order for 30 minutes. That's a bad waiter. Back in the deep state, they would say, oh, three years old? Look at this man. This man is nice. This man has a big smile. This man can carry a lot of things on, the, on his hand. He can carry so much in his one hand. Mary Todd would have been a great Mary Todd would have been a great server. Mm-hmm. She had this big hands. Huge hands. She wouldn't even need a tray. She'd just no. stack them up. Stack them up. So I wondered if you could talk a little bit about you are obviously not right now in the deep state. And so having spent so much time there, mm-hmm. once your talents were realized and, and used of course. by the deep state. Of course, of course. Maybe you can talk about both your time working there as an accountant and also – why are you here now? Why why are you on the surface? I am here because I was kicked out. I would, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. This is hard for me. Um, Take your time. I tried to raise alarm about an issue that is going on within the deep state. And they they did not like me raising alarm down there because it's a, it's a utopia down there. You got to understand. It's not... It's not like up here. And I knew that because of certain efforts by the surface state to get oil out of certain grounds around the Colorado-Wyoming border, that they they were ruining the structural integrity. Fracking is, I'm, I'm not I'm not political because I was a counter down there. I did a lot of counting. You know, I couldn't be political because part of my counting was votes. So I wasn't allowed to be political. But fracking has, has, has been ruining our foundation and they don't want to believe it. You understand? People in the deep state don't want to believe it. They don't want to believe it. But the walls shake sometimes. I'm an amateur seismologist. You understand? Uh, because, you know, it's a number thing. And I would I would tap the walls and I could ascertain from the sound what number of loudness it was and how sturdy that wall was. Because that's how you know how sturdy a wall is. Knock on a wall, loud, sturdy. Quiet, less sturdy. Medium, not sturdy. Was that the way that you first knew that this was an emergency because you were tapping on walls or was it? First, it was the earthquakes. Things fall down. And they try to they try to play it off. And I say, oh, oh, everything's cool. Everything's normal. This is just a normal event now. And the, it's been going on forever. But we know the history books. We see we see the things on the surface. They, we, you think we're not connected? We're connected. There are a series of outposts that go run under major highways from the Hunter Reservoir, which is sort of the the capital of the of, of the deep state, and they go out. And then at the end of these, uh, they're long, long tunnels, long, narrow tunnels. At the end of them, you know, p- people peek up through uh, sewers and see what's on TV, you know, it's in homes and whatnot. Yeah, or, or in Times Square, you know, you see the big, the big, the big Coke. That's how they watch TV. Yeah, we. That's how we have to. Okay. Yeah, you think we don't have wise? There's no there. reception. No reception. How did the, your uh, raising the alarm about fracking? I'm trying to figure out the accountant part of what you do. Why did it get you in trouble? I'm a, I'm an older gentleman, and by this point, this is the mid '90s. I have reached the post of equivalent of like the. Director of Finance or Director what's what's CFO the CFO for the for the whole deep state. So I, I had I had some I had a position. You understand? I, I I had people listen to me, or I thought they did. And then I so I went and I raised alarm, and it was a little bit too much for the powers that be. Hmm. And when you say the powers that be, are you referring to any celebrities that are widely thought? to be deceased who may not actually be? 
You referring to black celebrities specifically? I'm referring to ones that are both black and white. Okay. Okay, because you named a lot of black celebrities. Okay, but there were a few white ones in there too. Okay. Mm-hmm. Brittany Murphy's black. Brittany Murphy's Brittany black. Brittany black. As far as I can tell. Oh. So Kurt Cobain, a notorious uh, black guitarist, he. So here's the thing about the deep state is that there are competitions sometimes. You, you ever seen the movie Drumline, where you can just challenge somebody for the post at any time with a a battle at the thing they're good at. So that's what happens in the movie Drumline. I I watched a lot of media when I came up to the surface state because I wanted to understand what it was about. So you can challenge somebody. Kirk Cobain said, "Hey, uh, Mr. Governor, and this is the governor of one of the one of the districts, um, district Beard, and Kirk Cobain challenged District Beard to a to a rock off because oh. the, the governor of District Beard was known for having was well, Jimi Hendrix. So d- he challenge Jimi Hendrix to a rock off and I was like, Oh, Kirk Cobain's gonna lose. You know, just pure he's a great songwriter, but pure guitar talent. He's not he's not gonna win, but he won. He was practicing up, he won. So Kirk Cobain holds a high post. And I'm actually worried because I've been down there and, you know, since the mid nineties I'm trying to make my way back. But there are basketball tournaments. Mm. There are basketball tournaments that hold a basketball holds a high place in our society. High place, high place. So I'm not going to say that Kobe Bryant is there or not, but I'm not going not gonna to say not gonna say he's in. Well. I don't know for sure, but. Well vindicated. Wouldn't be far-fetched. Interesting, very interesting. What happened to Patrick Ewan? I don't know who that is. I think he's still here. He's still, he's still, still here. Still yeah. here. Yeah. Still oh, here. you know who else is in mm-hmm. potentially down there? Not accounted for? Rip Torn. Rip Torn. Another white person not accounted for. Where's Rip? Hashtag, where's Rip? I have that hashtag is trending in the deep state as well, or it was before I left. Oh, they have hashtags. Yep, they have hashtags. That's how we used it. That's how we shared. In share. the mid nineties, they had hashtags. We we didn't call them hashtags. We called them uh, pound signs, but they were used. In they the, were scratched on the wall. They were using a similar scratched on the wall. You think we're barbarians down there? What is wrong with you? I didn't mean to offend you. Do you think that all of our cultural phenomenons that we have in the upstate come from the deep state first? Think about it. Think about it. Because if there's one thing I know about deep state people mm-hmm. is that they're setting the trends and then we all take them. We are cultural influences. And once in a while we send somebody up to help bring the process along. Yeah, but all, all those cultural trends came from uh, um, bangs, deep state. Bangs. Wow. Let's see here. Uh, nose piercings, deep state. Are you just working your way down the body trying to remember? Yeah, just because uh, different trends, you know, different. We uh, it's how they work chronologically as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, bangs were real popular when I was a baby. Choker necklaces, choker necklaces, deep state, deep state. We, those were a tool of war. Those were, that was a weapon. The deep state's been to war. I thought it was the utopia. There was a war uh, back soon after soon after the deep state was founded, and uh, luckily. The Lincolns won, because of course it wasn't the you know it wasn't Union Confederacy, it was uh, the Lincoln the Lincolns and the Lincolns. They, we had the other group thought that Lincoln had an extra L. That's where the it, uh, you know war really started over petty things. Henry, we have to uh, wrap this up, but I wanted to ask you one more question. You were it sounds like banished from your home twenty five years ago, roughly. How does that happen when people leave the deep state? It's always been, I've always been curious about whether people do leave and like whether people go back and forth. And I'm wondering what you've been doing for 25 years. I don't, I've never heard stories of people going back and forth. When I was banished, you know, I, I, I saw these people coming in my room at night, my quarters, and they took me and I tried to get back in, but I can't find the door. I've been down to Hunter Reservoir hundreds of times. But uh, as far as I can tell, you have to jump into the reservoir itself. And I'm not I'm not ready to take that leap because it could kill me. What if it's the wrong reservoir? What if they move the reservoir? I don't know these things. I was just a counter. I, I've moved now. I've transitioned. I am a blackjack dealer at the Portland Casino. Great time, Portland up north casino. Are you retired, or that's something you do? As no, I need money. I didn't have. I don't have a. I was missing from the government from age eleven to 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 sixty one. 
So when they took you, when they booted you out, they just threw you up. Yes. Brutal. Threw me out. I wound up right in the middle of Portland. You know, that city in that coastal state. Hmm. Walk up right on the street. Tried to busk, but nobody wants to. Nobody wants simple math equations for money. Nobody wants me to count how much changes in their pocket quickly. A lot of things switched up on me in the meantime, and I just want to go back. Now, I know they don't want me. Deep State, if you're listening to this, and I know you're listening to this, let me back in. I'm telling you, all I want is to die with my people. I'm not, I'm not going to talk about the fracking no more. Okay, I'm done with that. I don't care no more. I just I just want to go down there and rest peacefully with my real family, uh, the Mary Todd's go MTs. Henry? Mm-hmm? Should I say count up, count count up, up Kelly? Kelly? How much would you be willing to give to have your dream come true? If, an, a numerical amount? You talking about a money amount? Would you give infinity? I would give infinity and beyond. That movie had just come out when I came back. Okay, well, we'll talk after this, but... Okay, we'll we'll talk. Okay. You're giving me those eyes. You can come down to Sheol with me, and I'll show you around. We'll have a nice talk. Maria, a question for you. Have your pupils always been black? My pupils are black, but my irises have not always been black. Okay. As well. Question. That's, thank you. That's all I need an answer. So it's the traditional whites of our eyes. Well, mine's are, mine, are the, mine are the blacks of my eyes. Mm-hmm. Because they're just all black. Okay, we are going to have to leave it there for now, which is unfortunate. That was really fascinating. I felt like we were just getting started. But I want to thank our guest this week, Henry Count em Up Kelly. Let me in. Let me in, please. And a big thank you, as always, to my co-host this week, Muriel Wolin. Thank you, Muriel. A big you're welcome, Russell. Next week, we will talk to Paul Gaggerns, a juggler who lives with his wife in a gully outside of Houston, and who thinks the deep state is controlling the actions of the federal government through animal mind control at the National Zoo. That's true. Oh. I mean, have you seen those pandas? They're too cute. They're too damn too cute. cute. Thank you for listening to Optophobia. I am Russell Dalrymple, and I will leave you with this. The power of music comes not from an instrument, but from the grander vibrations of life. If you've got theories about what the deep state really wants, we'd like to hear them. You can find us on our website at optophobia.org or on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at, at optophobes. And please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. Thank you to Bam Alston, who played Henry Kelly. Bam performs with Washington Improv Theater House Ensemble Lena Dunham. Follow him on Instagram at, at bam.gram. Liz Sanders played Muriel Woland. Liz performs with Madeline, a Washington Improv Theater house ensemble. Optophobia was produced by Tim Townsend. Music by Bart Warshaw. Cover art by Claire Smalley. Website by Chance Griffin. Thanks for listening. Until next week, keep them open. Thank you.